afternoon for everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, for this panel, and um, uh, we are glad to uh, to have the, today um, an, a discussion uh, about the the Middle East and uh, and and this circumstances that we have faced in in this region. And um, uh, I will put some uh, I mean uh, some uh, uh, simple. Uh, uh, housekeeping uh, rules first, and then we will start by introducing our esteemed uh, uh, panelists. Uh, and I hope that all of you uh, will enjoy the discussion and debate that we will have today. Um, uh, just uh, as an introduction, I hope that uh, this discussion uh, can be a space for all of us, uh, for uh, our participants in in the Zoom meeting or uh, with. Uh, indirectly with the people who are uh, watching us through the live uh, the live stream. Uh, first, uh, please, uh, there is an option to have uh, translation into uh, Arabic language. The main discussion will be in English. So please uh, use the button in Zoom uh, for interpretation and use the, the channel for English or Arabic. It will be available within the Zoom. And for the people who are watching live also, there is an option to watch uh, the uh, translation in Arabic or they watch in English. For all of the participants who want to, to speak or to comment or have a question, you can use the chat to uh, uh, write your questions uh, or you can uh, uh, use the button to raise your hand and then you can talk and speak and uh, using the camera as well. So please uh, feel free to, to write your questions if it's during the panelist interventions or after that, if you like uh, to have uh, direct interventions, you are very welcome. We will try as much as we can to expand the space for you to, uh, to have a discussion and to give uh, the panelists uh, the opportunities to, to, um, to have their responses as well. Uh, I'm glad to have uh, such esteemed uh, panelists with us. Uh, we, uh, from the Syrian Center for Policy Research, as non-for-profit organization, uh, this is not uh, uh, our first time. We participate several times before in organizing a, a panel uh, to discuss several policies regarding the Middle East within this space that we thank uh, the World Bank and IMF teams who support us to, uh, to, to take this opportunity and to open this discussion about the uh, policies related to our region. Uh, I am Rabia Nasser, uh, the uh, a co founder and researcher in the Syria Center of Policy Research, and uh, we are glad to, uh, to have all of you uh, here. Uh, I will start um, by an, an intervention to the panelists. Uh, we will start with uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Harun Under, a uh, senior economist in the World Bank. Uh, then we will go to Mary Noel Abiyadi, uh, co-director of uh, um, uh, Lebanon Support uh, before and now the uh, research center uh, for. Um, uh, let me sorry, the center for social science research and action. And then we will um, uh, will have an intervention from Omar Dahi, a professor at Hampshire College and Associated uh, Professor of Economics. And uh, he is the director of uh, Security and Context uh, in Initiative. And uh, the final uh, intervention will be by uh, Holly uh, Wilborn Pena. Uh, she is the World Bank resident representative in Jordan. So this is the uh, how we'll go through this uh, uh, the four interventions, um, and I will start by just uh, two minutes um, uh, to highlight the importance of this panel for us, uh, because in in the main, in the middle countries uh, we are as you know we are now uh, after almost eleven years of uh, starting the Arab Spring, it is a huge social movement across. Uh, different Arab countries and a lot of protests. It started, but it didn't finish. Unfortunately, we have this uh, transformation toward a conflict. We are now one of the top 
top regions in the world in terms of the internal conflicts, in terms of the impact, in terms of the displacement, refugees. Uh, all of you know the uh, catastrophic uh, impact of the conflict uh, uh, in our region. But what uh, I want to highlight that before the Arab Spring, uh, most of uh, uh, mainly the Arab countries performed well in the uh, measure of economic reform based on the international financial institutions. So, uh, for example, there is a lot of praise to Saudi Arabia and their performance in doing business, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Tunisia, etc. And after of all of these transformation toward economic reforms, we, uh, we have the uh, Arab Spring, the people uh, go to the street to refuse the oppression and they ask for freedom, but also they refuse the socioeconomic policies that have been implemented and increase inequalities in the region and increase the marginalization for a lot of people. It, it is uh, an evidence for us that the previous policy was, was not, were not the right policies for all of us to go in the right direction in terms of sustainable development and inclusive economy and inclusive economic growth as well. The, uh, what we have in addition to that, that we have uh, the conflict and the conflict economies, which is interact within the countries that uh, uh, that witness the conflict and it spill over across different countries in the region as well. So these complications created the new foundations for the economy and for the social development, which is in most cases uh, go for development in reverse instead of achieving uh, a progress for the future. COVID is another layer of the burden of this region. The COVID uh, uh, showed us the importance of uh, public services, the importance of the inclusivity, the solidarity to uh, make the economy work on the long run. However, uh, what, we what we are witnessing lately in the last two years, that there is a repetition of uh, policies that decrease the inclusivity and repeat the same mistake of supporting uh, a transformation toward more chronic capitalism. So avoiding the structural problem like, uh, uh, like the cronyists who control many sectors or affecting the increasing the inequalities in this region, we see that the, the economic policies that are proposed by IFIs concentrate more on the uh, stability, stability, for instance, for uh, exchange rate, for, uh, for uh, fiscal deficit, while ignoring or avoiding the structural problems like lack, lack of accountability for private sector or the crony relations between the elite uh, private sector and uh, international uh, businesses and the uh, political power in the region. In this framework, uh, I would like to, uh, to open the discussion, uh, which is, uh, a space for all of us to, to discuss how can we uh, re re rethink about the policies that we propose to the region, given that we have the conflict that we are talking about, given that we have the structural problem that we are facing, and how we uh, how can we make the uh, post-COVID policies a broad inclusivity and pro sustainable development rather than I mean, uh, uh, repeating some policies that unfortunately, um, I mean, resulted an outcome that we can see uh, uh, in, uh, across the region. I, I'm sorry if this is a, a long introduction, uh, I will go uh, directly to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Harun Onder, who is, I mean, uh, I mean uh, a specialist in, in, in the Syria conflict and in the region conducted, I mean, an excellent research with uh, new methodologies about how we, to, we understand the conflict in Syria and its spillover and impact around the region, among other, of course, research that he's conducted. Please, Harun, your, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Rabia, and thanks a lot for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to listen to you and, and uh, have a conversation around these very interesting issues. 
Let me try to share my screen uh, to see if I can manage that. Do you see the slides, Ravio? Okay, perfect. So uh, you, you laid out a very interesting and very rich uh, topology of discussion. Unfortunately, I will not be able to talk about all, all those issues, but I'll take from a, a bit narrow perspective and I'll talk about the importance of social research and how that uh, changes our understanding of the world, especially in this region, but also how it can help us to change the world itself. So from interpreting it to, to changing it. So today I'll be starting rather philosophically uh, talking about does, does knowledge matter at all? So as someone who makes a career out of producing knowledge, you wouldn't expect me to say no, but I will try to keep a healthy dose of skepticism. So, so stay with us on that. And I'll be talking about two special cases where we believe knowledge, the creation of knowledge were important, uh, both for understanding the world and also changing it. The first one is the economic impact of hosting refugees in the Mashrek region and also in, in a third country, in Kenya. And the second one is uh, what makes refugees return. Okay, so let's start this uh, rather gloomy uh, side, side of the problem. Is it really worth for us to try to better understand the world? Um, the, the answer may be no for several reasons. The first one is that it might be too costly. And this is a large hydron collider in Switzerland. You know that it took $4.5 billion and 10 years to, to build. And you can safely bet that there are many other research proposals who are unfunded and waiting for their turn. And many of them will not be funded. So the cost is a factor. The second one is that in certain situations, knowledge just does not matter. And here's an interesting example that I found from evolutionary biology. Uh, this paper shows that for different species, having a truer perception of reality does not necessarily make them fitter. And here's an example, the jewel beetle. This is famous. It's a vastly successful species. They are quite good at uh, reproducing, but they, don't, they, they have poor vision. So that's why you see in this picture, the male jewel beetle are trying to mate with the beer bottle because the texture of the beer bottle and the color of the beer bottle are, are very similar to their, their the animal's back. And the paper shows that in certain situations, just simple rules, for example, if this happens, respond as such, are better than just having a more complex understanding of the, of the reality. So you don't, you don't necessarily need that. And the third factor that I want to talk about is in certain situations, actually, Knowing things is, is a curse. It makes things worse. And here's an example, a very simple example. Uh, most of you would know this, a famous prisoner's dilemma game. If both players cooperate, they get two each. If they both cheat, like defect, they get one each. And if one cooperates, the other one cheats. Uh, the cheating one gets three. The other one, the cooperating one gets zero. So this is a symmetric game. So what happens when we play this game one time, the the equilibrium, the Nash equilibrium, is that players will not cooperate. However, we play this many times, infinitely uh, repeated games. Then if the players are sufficiently patient, you, they can cooperate. Uh, and this is because there is a threat for future punishment. If you do not cooperate today, I will not cooperate tomorrow or the rest of the game. So that future punishment threat makes them cooperate. In fact, we don't even need to play this infinitely. We just need to play this indefinitely, meaning that the players should not know when the game ends. Because when they know when the game ends, they will not cooperate in the last period because there's no future punishment threat. And because they are not cooperating in the last period, they will not cooperate in the period before, and then in the period before, and so on and so forth. So the entire cooperation collapses only because they know when the game is going to end. So three reasons why knowledge may not matter or may not be feasible. 
But uh, the idea of this presentation is that in certain circumstances, in the right context, knowledge can make a difference. And I will be talking about three case studies. The first one is uh, the regional impact of the Syrian conflict. We call this uh, the fallout of war. And the other one is uh, about the return of Syrian refugees, the mobility of displaced Syrians. And then I also chose something from another region to show that things in Maastricht are not, uh, like the findings of this analysis are not special to Maastricht. It's, it's quite general. And this, the third study is from Kenya. Okay, so the first example, how do the refugees affect the host countries? Um, when you look at the GDP trends in Lebanon and Jordan, you see that in the, in the 2000s versus the 2011 and after, which is the beginning of the Syrian conflict and the arrival of refugees and after, you see that the GDP growth rate, annual GDP growth rate decreased by 3.9 percentage points in Jordan and 4.4 percentage points in, in Lebanon. So the question that we, we ask, and this is sometimes repeated in some uh, uh, popular media, do refugees reduce the GDPs or did, did the Syrian refugees reduce this country's GDPs in that time frame? So to, while analyzing this, we also looked at other countries. What happened between the two decades in other countries? What we saw is that, okay, this is actually quite common. The slowdown in the growth rate between the two decades in the world is quite common. Uh, when you look at the middle-income countries, they also slow down by about 1.2 percentage points, and MENA, again, 1.3 or 1.2 percentage points slow down in the entire MENA, not only the neighbors of Syria. So that shows that at least a certain share of this slowdown in Lebanon and Jordan may be related with global factors like the global financial crisis, the lingering effects of that, and oil price dynamics, or perhaps the developments in the Gulf, the tensions. However, the reduction in Lebanon and Jordan GDPs were so large, like 3 point something and 4.4 percent, probably we cannot explain everything by these global or regional factors. So what we did was to conduct a counterfactual analysis uh, in the case of Jordan and Lebanon to see what would happen to their GDP if we did not have a conflict in Syria. And we found that the economic impact of the conflict in Syria on Jordan and Lebanon are 1.6 percentage points and 1.7 percentage points annual growth differentials, respectively, which means that if we didn't have a conflict in Syria, the Jordanian growth rate annually would be 1.6 percentage points higher. But the, the trick is that this was not driven by the refugee arrival. In fact, the refugee arrivals increased the GDP growth rate in these countries for very simple reasons. One, you have more consumers in the economy, so they, they, they have to consume, they need to eat. And second, they are just like more uh, workers in the labor market. So these two factors led to an increase in the GDP growth in these two countries. So where did the uh, negative effect come from? It came from the impact on trade, not necessarily bilateral merchandise trade between Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Syria, because those are re relatively small, but it is largely the transit trade through Syria for other markets. But at the same time, the services trade, like the tourism and the financial services exports in Lebanon and Jordan, those are much larger than the, the merchandise export. And those were hit because of the insecurity in the region and also the to a certain extent, lower arrival of uh, tourists from Syria. This doesn't mean that refugees are, are good for uh, Jordan and Lebanon necessarily, because there's uh, other complexities. If that was the case, we would see that countries lining up, uh, asking for more refugees. And unfortunately, we see that that's not the situation. So there's also the fiscal side. There's also the congestion to access to public services side. So it's a complex problem. But I'm not going to talk about that because those are included in, in our reports in, in very much detail. Just to show you how complex it is for us to be able to generate this counterfactual uh, analysis and also how the refugees affected these uh, GDPs only in these countries. 
we had to first run a synthetic control method based estimation to generate the counterfactual GDP rates. What would happen to GDPs of Lebanon and Jordan if there was no conflict? And then we fed that into a structural gravity model to generate the counterfactual trade flows. And then we fed those two results into a third model, which is a CG model, to decompose how the refugee arrival affected the GDPs of these countries. So this establishing the, the a rigorous assessment on, on, on these different effects is quite a complex task. Uh, were these special cases? So I'm talking about Kenya now. We see that uh, the results, the GDP results for uh, Mashrek were not that special. It's, it's similar in Kenya. Uh, earlier in around like 2016, the Kenyan government announced that they are going to close down the refugee camp, one of the largest in the world, Takuma, uh, and send the refugees back to wherever they want to go. And UNHCR approached us to conduct an analysis about the economic impact of the refugee camp in that area. Uh, unfortunately, th this compared to Lebanon and Jordan, this was even more data poor environment, so we couldn't observe a subnational GDP or other dimensions, but we looked at other things. For example, the, the, we had a medical uh, expert team in the group. They measure what they, it's called a sum of skin folds. So they measure the, the skin fold around different parts of the body. And that is correlated with the consumption pattern of people uh, in low income uh, settings. So we saw that the, the people closer to the refugee camp, they were uh, consuming better compared to people far away from the refugee camp. And that is because the refugee camp is like 180,000 people and they have to buy locally whatever they consume, they need to buy locally, creating demand for the production locally. This is like, for the local population, this is like exporting. Like suddenly you have a country who has to buy from you. So that creates some income for them. So that translates into better consumption. Uh, in the end, uh, the refugee camp was not closed. And I would, although I wish I could take uh, credit for, for that, by showing the economic impact, the, the causality is very difficult to establish, especially in, in, in such issues. Okay, let's talk about the second uh, uh, example. What makes refugees return? You might have heard in popular press or, may, or maybe some politicians repeated uh, in a populist manner that if refugees face comfortable conditions in exile, then they will not return. And by extension, that means that if they face difficulty, the conditions in exile, then they will return. We also analyzed this by looking at uh, the micro data for 2.1 million refugees in the Mashrek region. And then we unsurprisingly showed that yes, the security conditions in Syria matter the most in terms of the refugees return pattern. If better security, then more refugees return. But also the other like, access to services and economic conditions matter as well. And that is, we estimate by looking at the luminosity, night lights uh, estimations. Controlling for the security, better night lights means better return for Syrian refugees. But how about the conditions in exile? We found that the, the situation for the Syrian refugees was the opposite of what is being taught in a popular sense. In fact, it was the refugees who faced better conditions in exile who were more likely to return to Syria between 2011 and 2017. That was the time our data covered. And we look at this through the food security index and also the housing quality index um, against, against the common perception. Why do we have that? Unfortunately, our data was not enough to uh, establish causality to explain what exactly drives that mechanism, but we developed a, a little theory here uh, supported by anecdotal evidence to try to explain why. Refugees are mostly concentrated in the lower end of the income distribution. And at that level, return is a risky journey. It, it's costly in the sense that you need to be able to get your Syrian passport if you don't have one. one of the most expensive in the world. Last time I checked, it was about like $750 for expedited uh, shipment. Uh, so it's very costly and it's very risky. If things go bad in Syria, you might need to get out as well. But in the lower end of the income distribution, 
that the opportunity cost of that money and that risk is much higher compared to the higher end of the income distribution. For example, if you're very poor, you need to save from your dinner, your lunch, to buy those documents or to afford the return journey, which is very costly. You need to stay hungry. Whereas in the high end of the income distribution, the decision is maybe you'll, you'll need to use the savings in the bank. So the opportunity cost is much higher in the lower end of the income distribution. And that, that might explain why an improvement in conditions initially for the very poor refugees can actually increase the return pattern rather than decrease. But at the high end, it's the, it's the other way, obviously. Um, I was, I was a bit obviously cautious about presenting this to, to the governments of the region. Uh, rightly, they have, they, they have been burdened by a lot of economic pressure. But to our surprise, the analysis was appreciated uh, quite a lot. One of the high ranking officials in one of these Lebanon and Jordan countries told us that we only hear that our refugees do not return. They stay for 17 years on average. But now at least we have a more granular understanding of the situation on the ground. So together, these two examples, the, the Kenya uh, closure camp and also the appreciation of the information showed us that when, when we shed light by doing some uh, credible analysis, it is appreciated. This brings me to my conclusion. Uh, while conducting this analysis, I realized that there is sometimes a trade-off between uh, the statistical power of the, what we say, for example, the causal inference, can we confidently claim some mechanism or some effect versus the, the scope of the analysis. So in many areas about conflict, about refugees, uh, we are unable to measure issues. For example, social dimension, the cultural dimension. We are not good at measuring these issues and we are not good at establishing causality. So this dilemma leads to two different perspectives. For, for example, economists often take the one extreme, uh, concentrating around the statistical influence uh, dimension, but that leads to what we call a street light effect. This is the proverbial drunk who is walking in a street at night and he drops his keys. He cannot find it, but he walks down a bit further to find a street light to search for his keys, even though he dropped the keys up, up uh, somewhere else because he can see there better. So if you only look for specifically causal inference, we might be explaining only small parts of the problem, uh, which is not the main issue. But on the other hand, if we ignore this causal issue, if we do not consider empirical uh, verification, then we will be talking a lot about everything. We may be able to link those issues together, but we will not be able to show uh, how much different things matter. For example, in our analysis, when we were conducting the refugee return problem, um, we kept hearing that oh, it's all about security in Syria. Yes, we found that security in Syria mattered, but it's not the only thing. Even for controlling for the security in Syria, we are able to show that other factors matter as well. So we need, uh, the lesson from this assessment is that to be able to inform policy better uh, and lead to change on the ground, we need a convergence between these two extreme approaches, purely qualitative versus purely uh, quantitative approaches. We need a better synthesis. And finally, I have a bonus, what we are working on nowadays, so we just conducted a survey in Jordan last summer with uh, refugees, including some in the field uh, experiment with refugees. And it analyzes how the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic affected the labor market affect, uh, outcomes of refugees. And what is the role of risk preferences of refugees in explaining such outcomes? What is the role of the refugees exposure to trauma in explaining their risk preferences? And then what is the role of different conflict events in explaining the trauma? So it's a chain of uh, arguments. It goes from bottom to top. Unfortunately, the results are not ready. Hopefully in the next six, seven months, we'll, we'll come up with some, some conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Harun, for a very interesting presentation. And I think this is uh, to support many ideas and many policies that uh, 
that we, we would like to invest in as a civil society in the region, producing knowledge which is relevant, independent research, and of course, to have, uh, to, to have a, a kind of uh, uh, a model to, to, see, uh, uh, to see how the impact happened for the refugees in the region. I think this is very relevant. Uh, just in a quick, uh, I mean, uh, comments that it's very important to, to look also for, for that uh, who is receiving the knowledge. So it's not also just the quality of your research or the relevancy of your research. It's also the interest or the other parties who are receiving it because sometimes they refuse the results, even if it's relevant. And uh, the other issue is the uh, the problem of using the modeling, as as you know that, for for instance, CGE modeling, you know that uh, the conflict changed the 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 technical coefficient, so the whole structure of relations changed, and uh, using the modeling will be more difficult uh, through the the catastrophic issues like the conflict or refugees. But it's I think it's very interesting and it's very encouraging to to uh, introduce uh, the uh, these second panelist uh, and uh, which, which is uh, will, I mean will address the the social side um, Mani Noel Abiyadi uh, from the Center uh, for Social Science Research and Action uh, they in the center they have an, an excellent research on the uh, political science and also on the social science and uh, eventually they are concentrate on the social security in the Arab region and we would like to, to hear from uh, Mary Noel more about that, please. Thank you, Rabia. Um, if I get too patchy, please let me know. I might switch off my video. I'm from, I'm in Beirut at the moment and as you know, we're struggling with internet and infrastructure issues. Um, so, um, Yes, my, as you kindly introduced me, Rabia, my perspective is really one of a political science sociology approach. Um, um, basically, um, when we think of in our region about uh, social protection and social protection institution, I think before and, and, and the role in, in, in post crisis recovery. I think it's important to start with the basics uh, and reiterate that social protection does not come in a vacuum. Um, social protection, social protection institutions are part of social policy making and public action. And they are political programs and decisions that entail much more than a system of services or service delivery. They also, and primarily, they refer to rights and to processes or how these services are delivered, what kind of services um, we're talking about. Are we talking about social security, social assistance or social safety nets, health, housing, education, labor market activation, etc. It also refers to whom is delivering these services and who in Fine has a say in the allocation of these services and to whom they are supposed to be delivered. So I think it's important to keep in mind that these um, concepts refer to processes and political processes, but also agreements or contracts um, that reflect the social rights of citizens and residents. Um, so social protection as a pillar of any recovery program is a political question a priori beyond technical uh, issues. Um, but also it is important to, to, to remember that social protection is a concept that is quite politically charged and contested um, discursively and in praxis as it stems from the international cooperation arena, IFIs and their structural adjustment programs. And it is structurally linked to North-South relations and colonial and post-colonial aid uh, dynamics. But 
In order not to further digress, I will try to use a working definition for social protection within a public action, of course, broader framework. So I will refer to social protection as all public and private initiatives that provide income or consumption transfers um, and services to protect against life shocks throughout the life cycle of individuals. At its core, social protection is a form of redistribution of wealth and income. Social protection is also usually provided by the state. It is theoretically conceived as part of a state citizen social contract in which states and citizens have rights and responsibilities towards each other. Looking more specifically at our region, the MENA, witnesses ongoing crisis. Uh, it is porous to geopolitics, uh, and it is also ridden by internal conflicts. It is also one of, if not the most unequal uh, region in the world. And lastly, Regimes across the region rest on autocratic bargains, where we witness varying degrees of what we call authoritarian hybridity, with on the one hand, undem undemocratic and predatory elites that capture public resources, and the other, populations that have, as Rabia mentioned in his introduction to the panel, populations that have repeatedly set forth demands for a social question, a social question, as Kevin Harris coins it, in sometimes very subdued contestations, invisible, and as well as in more visible protest forms, contentious for, um, movements, notably the, in, during the so-called, or as of the so-called Arab Spring, always setting forth uh, grievances or demands for greater social justice. A decade has passed uh, since the first Arab Spring uh, social movement started, putting at the forefront of public debates, social and economic grievances of people in the region. The problematic also set forth by these popular movements is that these issues and rights cannot be thought, considered, nor tackled without addressing political issues and rights such as political participation, freedom of association, assembly or expression, accountability to political representatives, political alternates and circulation, to name only a few pillars of what constitutes democratic systems, so not mere governments, so-called governments. And although these movements have been contained or fully repressed by resilient authoritarian regimes in the regions, grievances and demands remain. In particular today, when the world is two years into a pandemic and a public health crisis that has put again at the forefront the importance of social rights, namely the right to health and to social security, hegemonic neoliberal policies are yet again continuing to push forward the imperative of austerity, especially in the countries of the global south, and in the countries of the MENA. Similarly to structural adjustment programs um, in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken, that have notably triggered from the top of my head waves of protests in Tunisia, Jordan, and Egypt, for example. IFI's in interventions in the region structurally consolidate unjust systems as well as the fractures that exist between these systems and political elites on the one hand and populations on the other. Across the region, we can draw some characteristics regarding social protection regimes. Social protection that I reiterate is considered as the main pillar of social justice. We have first characteristic, socioeconomic models with very limited redistribution and very unequal taxation systems that hit the poorest members of society, such as VAT, for example. Second characteristic, we have an absence of 
comprehensive, integrated and rights-based social policies across the countries of the region, with very limited measures on social protection and social spending, notably on education and health. These social residual social policy regimes are typically characterized by a reliance on non-contributory social assistance, notably by non-state actors. The third characteristic is that employment-based or Bismarckian-inspired social insurance um, systems are predominant in the region and or across the countries of the region. And these also typically leave behind very large populations of uh, parts of the populations, typically agricultural workers, self-employed, uh, freelancers, informal workers, and persons with disabilities. The fourth characteristic um, is that we have very limited, if at all present, focus on the job market and unemployment, with a labor force that is also structurally characterized by informality, with up to two thirds of workers in the informal sector. Social insurance appears more of a luxury for private and public workers. Um, and even so, I mean, if we, uh, if you allow me a very small example uh, they, um, taken from a recent uh, study we have recently published on Lebanon, we are witnessing a social downgrading of these populations that could have been considered prior to the current crisis in Lebanon as rather well off. The fifth characteristic is that these systems um, are reactive and crisis and adopt a crisis management approach to social protection that is mainly also led by international donors' agendas and merely focused or primarily focused on poverty alleviation rather than rights. This comes with an emphasis on targeted social assistance and cash transfers programs that are insufficient in coverage and levels of benefits. If you look at Jordan, Tunisia, or Lebanon, I think the data speaks for itself. Um, these programs, transfers programs, are often coupled with systematic or cuts on uh, systematic reductions or cuts on subsidies as a measure to, bal to balance uh, public budgets. Subsidies, although being a completely for us regressive form of social protection, are oftentimes appear as the only form of universal uh, social protection mechanisms in, in countries of the region. This leads to very embryonic um, protection systems in the region that are more ad hoc and charity based rather than rights and citizenship based. These systems directly feed into precarity and poverty even more so, and here again, allow me an example from Lebanon, our research has shown, for example, how they directly feed into clientelistic and patronage systems between populations that are kept into situations of uh, dependence to work and their political patrons, or as we call them here, uh, the Zayims. But more so, these pro-poor approaches invite us more at least to question or reflect on the near notion of poverty, um, notably in a region where philanthropy, charity, and so-called pro-poor approaches are so prevalent. How can we define sociologically, so I don't have fancy equations, sorry. How can we define sociologically poverty while being aware that it is a very fluid and transient state? As our global economies have shown, and global economies in crisis have shown recently, every person can lose a job, a source of income, access to social security if they have it. Also, it raises the question. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry, almost done. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you have one or two minutes to wrap up, please. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Also, Thank it. <laughs> sorry. 
Also, it raises um, the question of how we tackle the issue of poverty or assistance without stigmatizing the so-called poor. Today, as many region, uh, as many examples from the region show, from Tunisia to Jordan to Lebanon, poverty targeting that has been implemented since decades did not succeed in reaching more vulnerable or poor populations. They hence seem to only address the symptoms of inequality while leaving completely untouched the socioeconomic structures that produce and reproduce them. So it appears to us as scholars or researchers from civil society that IFI's interventions or bailouts appear to further consolidate authoritarian bargains in the countries of the region and in maintaining prevalent socio-political status quo, thus reinforcing structural inequalities. While people from the region today, I think more than ever, are trying and have been trying to reimagine social contracts and setting and embark on new imaginaries of universality and rights-based systems. Thank you and apologies for speaking so long. Well, th thank you very much. Thanks a lot for uh, you give us this scope of uh, social security and social protection, which I think it's part of the contradictory policies that we are seeing in the region. And we don't have like uh, uh, at least uh, a roadmap to overcome all of these inequalities and marginalization. Thank you very much. Uh, I will move to, uh, directly to uh, Dr. Omar Dahi. Uh, 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 Omar is a distinguished uh, political economy uh, scholar working in an amazing uh, 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 academia field and, of course, on policy-oriented research as well. We are very happy to have you, Omar, and please, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Rabia, so much for uh, this uh, invitation and for organizing the panel. Special thanks to the Syrian Center for Policy Research, and thanks to my colleagues on the panel. It's really a pleasure to be speaking alongside of you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and make, uh, in the time that I'm allowed, uh, a series of points that I'm uh, labeling under the general banner of assessing IFI policy in MENA over the last decade, or perhaps since the start of the, the uprisings. And I'd like to make a series of propagations uh, on uh, how can we uh, think about um, the, the, the policies, uh, have they changed, have they, has there been any learning? I appreciate uh, Dr. Harun's uh, introduction about knowledge. Uh, I teach at Hampshire College, an institution whose motto uh, the slogan in Latin is non satis sciri, which means to know is not enough. Uh, and I think this is an important thing to think about. About we, we have a lot of knowledge about what has happened in the past. And I think the issue is that that's not enough. We have to act on that knowledge. And I'd like to review some of the things that we know over the past decade and before and, and sort of some provocations about moving forward. Uh, so I'd like to make this series of points uh, on... Um, the role of IFIs, their policies. Uh, the, the first few things I would say is that, uh, as we all know, the COVID pandemic has highlighted many issues. Uh, among others is that the problems of poverty and underdevelopment cannot be solved solely by markets or individual countries. We've seen how there's the need for coordination. We have seen how problems uh, of contagion uh, are, are, are real. Uh, we've also seen how there's been a recognition of the urgent need of uh, governments uh, and of uh, social policies, investments in public health, investments in infrastructure, uh, investment in social trust and, and, and combating uh, um, corruption and increasing accountability to increase societal trust in uh, public action. Um, the problems in MENA, of course, uh, uh, are not just those of poverty and underdevelopment, but they're also compounded by uh, in addition to neoliberal policies, we've had conflicts, wars, invasions, and, and other issues. Uh, and so uh, in addition to the lessons that we've learned from the region and other regions about economic policy, I think there's a real need for approaching uh, the totality of what's happening, to, to think about our approach 
as taking into account the entire web of connections, which includes the conflicts, which includes war economies, uh, and as well as um, the, the traditional uh, development models. The second point is echoing what uh, Dr. Rabia said in the beginning, is that the recurring crises that have happened since the Asian crisis, at least, but uh, um, also revealed by the MENA uprisings, has been the failure of neoliberal prescriptions. Uh, as I'll return to later on in the presentation, a lot of the countries that witnessed the most severe crises, or many of them at least, were, were described as top reformers. Uh, and were given very positive encouragement by international financial institutions from the 2000 to the 2010 uh, uh, decade. I think in uh, many ways there's been introspection and positive developments by the, FI, uh, by the IFIs. Uh, there's been some shift in action that has been welcomed to rethink the Washington consensus policies of the past, the so-called Washington consensus policies. However, there's also evidence of inertia of business as usual both in rhetoric and practice, if, if we look at the region, uh, if we look at a lot of the agreements with governments, and that includes both the traditional approaches of stabilization, uh, austerity, uh, uh, trade liberalization, deregulation, privatization, the standard measures that were part of structural adjustment packages, they haven't uh, perhaps come in the same form or for the same depth in terms of the packages of the 80s and, and, and 90s, but uh, they're still there. There's also increasing evidence of indirect pressure, such as what, what has been referred to as benchmarking. Uh, a lot of the information that's published out there uh, by international financial institutions uh, under publications such as Ease of Doing Business, which ranks countries in very much of these rankings coincide with those who are practicing the traditional neoliberal prescriptions of uh, austerity, privatization, deregulation. This uh, ranking has tremendous influence in various ways on investors, on the capacity to raise funds in capital markets and, and a whole host of issues. Uh, so these are, we're seeing indirect ways in which sort of business as usual can, can continue even if there's been a public acknowledgement that we need to rethink the past policies. So what are the problems, of course, with this business as usual approach? I think in the region, there are a lot, and I'm gonna list some of them, of course, for time constraints, we can't go into them, but I hope we can have a discussion. Uh, I think a major part of the issue is real lack of accountability uh, in, in the private sector uh, throughout the region. Uh, so you have a lot of programs, we have a lot of policies that are legacies of the past that have been undone. These programs which have provided social protection, which have provided redistribution, to, to use the, the words of my dear colleague who, who just presented, uh, these are legacies of past policies that have been there to protect the poorest and most vulnerable populations. Removing these policies, deregulating them, has removed the shield, protecting the vulnerable in populations and in societies that are marked by elite capture, by crony capitalism. That some of these policies have been the last shield of defense and, and there has been basically a lack of accountability for the alternatives. We have seen public-private partnerships uh, without uh, governance reform, without institutional reforms are going to lead very predictably to inefficient projects uh, and increased corruption. So it's really crucial, as I started saying at the beginning, to understand the intersection of uh, the political economy factors with real economic performance, the understand the importance of, of the institutional frameworks, um, not to mention, of course, the conflict, the wars in the region, the, uh, uh, the war economies that, that are really regional in, in scope uh, in both licit and illicit ways, uh, investments in conflict, investments in destruction, investments in, in warfare, rather than investments in real sectors. Um, uh, in addition to, of course, the legacy of, of state entrenchment, uh, entrenchment uh, which has, has been steadily, uh, um, you know, happening despite the blip that we've seen uh, with the COVID. Liberalization of prices and the reduction of subsidies that target the poor uh, has also ignored the weak and, and corrupt institutions for, for various reasons. We don't have the capacity in, in many of these countries to undertake the targeting that is required. 
Um, and that is why uh, uh, the, the sort of the subsidies that have existed before have, have enabled the vulnerable to be reached. Uh, and therefore, there's there's an issue with uh, not taking into account the, the the institutional framework that exists. Uh, not to mention the fact that in many of those countries, uh, a, a somewhat middle class lifestyle has been enabled by these subsidies. So that the removal of these subsidies will essentially mean that significant number of people who supposedly should not be targeted have now become among the poor have because of the, the their proximity to, to the poverty level. What has been lifting them above these poverty level is the subsidies themselves. So I think, you know, for, for various instrumental and also empirical reasons, um, we, we really need to pay attention to, um, you know, how we prescribe policies that um, re regardless of their intention, uh, in fact, as they intersect with existing institutional frameworks lead to uh, significant deterioration in living standards. Uh, I think uh, we, we can we can say that in in the uh, various decade and, and even beyond, the implementation of floating exchange rates uh, has not uh, necessarily resulted in more competitive economies. We haven't seen significant um, uh, reformulation and industrial competitiveness uh, in in many places. Um, and and I think there's really another one of these um, uh, approaches that, that really need to, to think about moving forward. Of course, uh, the lack of real investments, the lack of growth, the lack of structural transformation uh, that is hoped for has increased informality uh, and, and deepened the, the precarity and the poor conditions for workers. So those who are uh, still lucky enough to get uh, jobs uh, in the informal sector have seen their working conditions deteriorate, they're more hazardous, they're more toxic, they have less uh, social protection uh, in, in, in the ways that, that my colleague uh, mentioned. There, in addition to the problems with the business as usual, there are also major gaps. So there's the existing approaches, but also there's approaches that are not taken or not significantly taken that really, uh, I think, uh, uh, moving forward really need to be uh, uh, rethought. Uh, for one thing, the international institutions have not really adopted a meaningful participatory approach for design and implementation of economic policies. I think the vast social movements that have started with a lot of hope uh, a decade ago um, uh, throughout the region have really reasserted the agencies of Middle Eastern societies. So how can we respond to these vast social movements who went out on a limb against repression and authoritarianism and against a whole series of counter-revolutionary forces and really have ways to understand societal priorities, to have a dialogue about, about this rather than responding to state top-down priorities that really have been subjected to elite capture. Second, how can we respond to conflict or war economies that have become endemic to the region? How have international institutions changed their approach to center countering the regional networks of conflict and illicit economies, which are not simply aberrations, which are not simply uh, a side uh, shows that sort of we can sort of acknowledge but not take into account. We need, we need to do that centrally in, in how we, we, we think about the question of development. Uh, third, environmental justice. How can we move on uh, when the region and the planet in particular is on fire, so to speak, literally on fire due to wars, but also due to the climate change? Uh, I think there's been a lot of movement in, in many ways on in, environmental issues, but I think the question of environmental justice, environmental equity needs to be a lot more central in, in how uh, uh, we, we approach uh, development policy. And more broadly, uh, there's, there needs to be attention to what I, what I label the nexus of militarism, securitization, and conflict economies, and the intersection with inequities of various kinds, including economic inequities, but also uh, regional inequities, gender inequities, and, and other inequities exacerbated by, by these issues. And finally, the nexus of uh, uh, the, the, the third leg is environmental injustice. I'd I'll like to share you another... in two minutes, please. Two, two minutes, minutes, yes, very, very quickly. I'd like to share here, I, I come return to this, but basically there's, um, this is from based on the World Economic Outlook, citing um, Kentankalinis and Stubbs who are projecting um, based on the public, uh, the World Economic Outlook, uh, significant retrenchment in uh, in uh, fiscal spending, and uh, they've mapped it out by region, 
and there and I can go into this more if, if you have, people want an explanation about this, but we can see that the biggest anticipated retrenchment is throughout the MENA region in, in various ways, with some exceptions. Uh, the green is countries that are going to keep the same levels of spending as they had in the 2010s before COVID. Uh, but uh, we anticipate, uh, again, based on, on projections by the IMF, which of course is not simply projections, but it's part of their discussions with these countries, part of the uh, loan negotiations and, and other agreements of, of significant spending, which the 2010s themselves may have been retrenchments over previous spending. So this is significant cuts. Uh, so I, I want to end by saying, let us not repeat the mistakes of the past. And and end with some big big questions. Uh, I think a major failure of the uprisings, among many other reasons, of course. Uh, but there is also a lack of an alternative development model that can attract a societal consensus to defend and push forward a democratic transition. Of course, multiple actors played a role in this failure, but I think importantly the IFIs. And I'm going to end here one last minute. Uh, I'm not going to read this full quote, but I just want to, again, you know, insist on not repeating the mistakes of the past. Uh, and, and quote from an article that, that I co-authored in 2008, uh, which uh, we argued that contrary to the view that finds little reason for gradualism as prescribed to the World Bank, there are significant socio-political costs to a big bang approach. In a majority of MENA countries, certain sectors and groups will stand as absolute losers from the reform programs, at least in the short run. The economic and political failures of the past have created an unstable environment pregnant with socio-political fault lines. Um, on the other hand, Slow growth rates, increasing unemployment, lack of democratic institutions, and increasing income inequality have poked more holes in the social fabric in the countries. The worsening economic performance has radicalized the divide between urban and rural, secular and Islamist, and ethnic identity groups, and these politicized fault lines have in turn been accompanied by increasing authoritarian governance in the region. Skipping forward to the last element of this, and then to repeat this, the experience of the MENA countries suggests that historically determined institutional characteristics and the political environment of country are of crucial importance in determining both the nature of the adjustment process and subsequent economic performance. We you know, wanna stress that you know, this issue, I think there's a deja vu involved when, when thinking about these and we really, really wanna move away from that. Uh, sorry for exceeding my time and I thank you and I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much, Omar. Uh, I think you, you open a, a lot of uh, questions and uh, major, uh, uh, gaps regarding the policies, and uh, I think this is interesting to see how we can go further in this uh, research to uh, create alternatives. Uh, I'll move directly to uh, Dr. Holly Wilburn Benner. Uh, she is the World Bank uh, resident representative in Jordan. She has an experience of more than 15 years in uh, development policies in uh, countries that are facing transition, reform, conflict, and displacement. Um, so uh, please, um, the floor is yours and you are very welcome, please. Thank you, Dr. Robbie, and thank you for uh, bestowing a doctorate upon me too. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have this, but I'll take it. <laughs> and thanks to the uh, Syrian Center for Policy Research and really for all the very rich um, panelist interventions so far. This is, I'm, I will not be able to do justice and, and answer all of these topics raised, but um, what I would like to do is just spend a few minutes um, and to, to talk through the question that was posed to us is how the bank has changed its policies and approaches in the region due to social movements, conflict and COVID-19. I'm gonna zoom in just a bit on the Jordan example. So I can't speak for the broader region, but I wanted to sort of take us from the, the research into the, the practicalities of the World Bank program on the ground here. So. This will be my angle and I'll, I'll be quite brief because I think it would be great to have a discussion and exchange. So I wanted to mention three examples of this um, and then maybe a bonus discussion on the ongoing public sector modernization work that's happening here in Jordan. So the three areas I wanted to look at is the refugee impact in Jordan. And I think Karun sort of began this discussion. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about how we've adapted there. The second is on the COVID shock and how we've adapted. And thirdly, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, forward look more on uh, a significant social inclusion issue around women's economic opportunities and female, female labor force participation. 
I think this is an area where we've certainly, I think, failed to date and where we are really trying to think about how we move the needle in the future. So these were the three. Um, first, just to say briefly on the, on the refugee side and how our program has adapted. Um, certainly 10 years plus after the Syrian crisis, we're still facing a situation where Jordan is hosting over 1.3 million refugees. So this is over 13% of its population. Um, and I think, uh, Rune, I won't go through the details of the, the impacts of the refugee crisis in Jordan, uh, but certainly it's, it's had positive impacts in terms of labor market and growth, but also uh, detrimental impacts in terms of service delivery um, and other um, uh, response issues, so, and environmental issues. Um, I think what we've seen in Jordan is that the government has taken a quite progressive developmental approach to the crisis. So has really, to a degree, promoted refugees' access to employment, um, to services. Um, refugees have access to education services. They have a, a dual shift um, approach to schooling here. Uh, also, in terms of the COVID response, refugees had equal access um, to uh, medical care as well as to the COVID-19 vaccine. So in a lot of ways, you've seen a quite progressive approach. And what we've done as the World Bank here in terms of our response is that we've really built uh, our programs around um, how do we strengthen support both to uh, Jordanian hosting communities as well as to refugee populations within a national support program. Uh, and I think this sort of developmental oriented approach um, is, is the, has to be in a way the future direction of the response, um, especially as we see humanitarian aid decreasing in the region uh, and so that we can really frame it as a sort of win-win approach, both for governments and Jordanian host communities, as well as for refugees. So we, we've had a, a good portion of our program, over 1.6 billion uh, from since 2016, that has gone to support for both uh, refugees and hosting communities. This has been in the areas of labor market access, on education services, health services, um, so this has been a quite comprehensive approach. We've also tried to include in some of our more forward-looking programs in growth sectors like agriculture, a focus as well on refugees. So I think this has been a bit of our, our approach uh, sort of practically at a country level on how we've addressed the crisis um, sort of 10 years on is how do we really think about adapting our national programs to be more inclusive and to target refugees and other vulnerable populations as part of these broader national support programs and lending. So I wanted to make that, that first point. Um, and then secondly, on the how we've adapted on the COVID shock. And also, I think um, there were some really good points raised by the panelists about how uh, this adaptation focuses on inclusion and also addressing some of the structural issues that were very much present even before the COVID-19 crisis. So here as well, we've seen in Jordan a really significant expansion of our, exponential, I would say, expansion of our program over the last couple of years across a number of areas in terms of both the immediate response as well as um, how do we work towards a more inclusive, resilient, uh, climate responsive recovery. So I just wanted to give a few examples here. Um, certainly we've, put a lot of funding and support around uh, health, the healthcare response and on COVID-19 vaccinations. And here um, we've been able to reinforce what has been a very inclusive uh, system in Jordan on vaccine access, for example. Um, so I think this has been a, a valuable contribution. I also, and um, I think Marie Noel highlighted a lot of issues on the social protection system. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this for Jordan because we've seen through COVID, uh, we were, uh, it was good timing in a way because we had invested a lot in the reforms to Jordan's social protection system as part of our budget support operation pre-COVID. So reforms like improving uh, the targeting formula, digitization, uh, creating sort of a single gateway for social assistance response, and also linking the social protection system to employment opportunities in the labor market so, so for more sustainable assistance. So this came in quite handy uh, when the COVID crisis hit, 
we were able to kind of quickly expand our support to government uh, for the cash transfer assistance over the last couple of years. Um, and now I think, you know, in the region, uh, Jordan is one of the more progressive examples in terms of cash transfer support. Um, certainly, we're still learning and improving and supporting government to improve. But I think instead of the narrowing of social assistance, we've here seen you know, very much the expansion of it and also the modernization over the last few years. So I think COVID-19 was actually uh, gave us a, a good opportunity in this realm uh, to reform a social protection system and really think about this uh, in a more sustainable way. So I did want to want to mention this example. Um, certainly lots of issues still to resolve, but I think for Jordan, this is an interesting example for the region. And then on COVID response, we're also doing quite a bit in terms of um, uh, both growth and employment issues. So we just actually this week supported government in the launch of a new national employment program that focuses on private sector led job creation. Within that program, we have a, a, a target um, basically of 35% women's labor force participation and job creation, as well as um, a focus on um, bringing in beneficiaries of the cash assistance system. So this is a short term fix, but I think um, it starts to go in the direction of, of promoting more inclusive job creation. This is really critical for Jordan because of the over 50% youth unemployment rates and three out of four young women being unemployed. Um, so these are just some examples. And then the last one I wanted to mention on the more sort of mid to longer term, uh, the opportunity of COVID in addressing some of the structural issues. We also have a program for results that's focusing on inclusive and climate resilient recovery, which is very much focused on how to promote both public and private investments in Jordan that have some attention to um, climate dimensions um, and then also have a more participatory process in terms of, of project design. So I think this goes a little bit to what some of the issues that have been raised on how do we take advantage of the sort of influx of resources for COVID response and recovery to address some of these underlying structural issues uh, that have plagued Jordan for some time. Um, so those are just some thoughts on the COVID shock. And then I wanted to finally just say, um, thirdly, a few words about female labor force participation in Jordan. And here, I think I want to be very um, clear that I think that we've we've failed Jordan uh, in a way thus far in our support. So, um, you know, Jordan's female labor force participation rate right now is 14%, and we've seen very little change in that over the last few years. Certainly the situation has gotten worse with COVID. Um, we've been trying to begin to tackle the challenge from different angles um, because certainly it's a multifaceted one. Um, and I think, you know, we have some progress on public transport, on the job creation side that I mentioned through our national employment program, through SME support. Um, but what we're trying to think about now and moving forward is how we have a more impactful um, a set of activities and results that really focus on this key inclusion issue for Jordan, because certainly the country is not going to grow and prosper if half of its labor force is out of work and not contributing. Um, so I think I just wanted to highlight this as an area where I think uh, as IFIs, we need to, to really put this more centrally in our discussion on economic policies and economic reforms. Um, and then just lastly, as one bonus point, um, with the um, Royal Court in Jordan has launched um, and pushed for sort of three big modernization of the state initiatives over the last year, one on more on political reforms um, focused on enhanced participation for youth and women, the second um, around a public sector modernization agenda. And thirdly, on um, uh, creating an economic vision for the next 10 plus years in Jordan. And so um, I think this also offers us an opportunity to really put a lot of the issues that you raise more centrally on the table and in our dialogue with government. We're supporting on the public sector modernization work, which has at its, at its center um, how to create more responsive, effective, and um, 
participatory governance arrangements. Um, so I, I hope that this will provide some openings to tackle some of these entrenched governance issues, et cetera, that um, impact everything that we, we do here. Uh, so let me end with that and just thank you all again for the very frank and open dialogue and I, uh, very thought-provoking presentations that I will certainly take forward in um, our work here in Jordan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, this is very relevant to our discussion and uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, maybe I always am using um, uh, my, my position and as a moderator and uh, to highlight the issue of uh, if female labor force participation i think it's uh, it's uh, it's across the region the low participation of uh, of women in the labor force and uh, i can give an example from syria before the conflict there is a huge drop in the female uh, participation in the labor force between 2000 and 2010 before the conflict and uh, part of the, our analysis, we have uh, substantial, uh, we, we collect uh, 10 surveys in 10 years and we do the analysis. And a uh, substantial part of that was related to the, uh, the drop of the public uh, jobs opportunities, which I mean, gives the woman uh, a minimum uh, protection. Uh, while in the informal sector, uh, most of the female moved to the informal sector where we, they didn't find the protection and or even the uh, minimum wage that it's um, suitable for, for decent work. So we have a drop for 20% participation to 13%. Uh, and I think the only exception in the region is in the Gulf countries where uh, there's some government who recruit the, the, uh, the women like in Kuwait, but it's not, uh, I mean, relevant to the uh, economic activities like in the other uh, countries in the region. So I think it's very important issue as well to, to see why uh, we, if we have 5% to growth or 4% to growth and we are expanding uh, uh, our economic base, why we can't engage uh, women in, in the economic activities. I think this is very important issue. Uh, okay, I, I think uh, we have a very rich uh, interventions and um, I think uh, there is many issues uh, have been raised. So I will open the floor uh, to whom uh, want to uh, raise a question. Uh, I, again, if you want to use the chat, you can use it. If you want to use the mic, just raise your hand if you want to, have, uh, I mean, to raise any question. And uh, I mean, then you should, uh, I mean, if you are use the interpretation, you should use the same channel with your language. Like if you are talking English, you choose the English uh, channel. Is there uh, any questions from the participants? Okay, maybe some, uh, I need to encourage you to, to start. Okay, so I, if, if, uh, since I didn't receive the questions, uh, I will continue the, uh, the this uh, this dialogue that we started. Um, uh, I will start uh, with Harun, and um, uh, my question, Harun, for you that when you when you build the analysis uh, about refugees, uh, I will I will raise three factors that might affect the results. The first one, and you tell me if this is relevant or not to to uh, to the results that you concluded. The first one is the, the factor that, for instance, that UNHCR or World Bank is conducting the survey, which make uh, the beneficiaries are facing the, the actor who are giving the, uh, the subsidies. Is this affect the results? The second one is the fear. Especially, you mentioned that poor people are, I mean, is not the, 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 the more uh, relevant to come back or to return. I think uh, uh, sometimes these groups are marginalized and they under the fear of expressing their willingness to, to return. As this might be one factor also to affect this uh, in this regard. And uh, do you have the factor of the political background of those refugees? Because this also might be a factor if they are 
not facing, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a, th a threat uh, for their lives with with the actors in the, in the inside the country. Like in Syria, we have four actors now. So if I am coming back to to a, a place where the actor is the opposite, or they, I mean, consider me as a terrorist, or consider me as, as some as someone not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, acceptable to be in the country. So it will be another factor might be uh, introduced to this discussion. So this is. Um, I add this to just to uh, to 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 raise the I mean to our more to our to our uh, to raise our understanding of the knowledge that we are build, building uh, and conclude the policies. Thanks, uh, Rabia. You're you're one of the uh, persons I'm always afraid to present because you you both know the context better and you also have a very good understanding of the analytics that goes into this type of assessment. So. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you raised these issues. Um, so do people change their responses whether, because they have some expectations, if this is UNHCR organizing, perhaps it's linked to the aid that I might receive one day. This is, this is a very valid concern. Uh, to offset that, we, when we conducted uh, uh, surveys in one of the previous studies, we compared the questions between uh, the vulnerability assessments implemented by UNHCR, WFP, FAO versus the World Bank to see if there are any differences. And then in another survey, we didn't reveal the information of the which organization is, is uh, implementing this survey. So we compared them. We didn't find much uh, difference uh, in terms of the answers. But that's a, obviously a very good example uh, concern. Do, do they fear of reporting? And um, that, that's obviously the, the social pressure in the self-reported uh, answers is a valid concern for all surveys. Not only, it, it doesn't have to be fear, but it might be some peer pressure. That the, the group you live in, you, there might be some sort of a implicit pressure under, the, under which the person operates who responds. So to offset that, we, we, act, we ask questions directly uh, would you, for example, would you return in, in the next three months, six months, and compare that to the, the person's characteristics? But also we created um, what we call vignettes, kind of hypothetical situation. It's not you. Do you think we don't ask you whether you would return, but we tell you that here's a, here's a person, his name is Ahmed, and he is an engineer or, or he's a construction worker. He has two daughters. He does this, describe the a hypothetical individual and then ask, do you think this person would return or not? So it, it they kind of deassociate the return decision from the from the respondent himself or herself. So that's like it's not the rounds the rounds the wheels of ignorance. It's yeah. I mean similar to that, yeah. So I mean we, we we don't we don't necessarily claim that it addresses this issue hundred percent, but I think it, it alleviates some of the concerns in that regard. Um, do we know the political background of the refugees? I, it is difficult to measure this unless you have a very intimate uh, connection with the person. So we didn't directly ask, but uh, in some of the in, in some of the surveys, since we know where the person came from within Syria, um, we know which languages he, he he speaks or she speaks. We know the religious context background. So some of those are. Uh, relevant categories in terms of uh, potential associations, but we, we don't directly ask such questions in surveys because those, those are a bit, there are some ethical issues. And also want to address your previous comments about CGs. I don't, I don't use CGs in Syria, so obviously for the reasons that you mentioned, the, the, the reason why you, we use CGs in the regional impact of the, of the conflict was because uh, it was about Lebanon and Jordan. At that time, we didn't have such a crisis in Lebanon and Jordan. So it was more, the input output tables were relatively normal. Uh, for Syria, we actually used a, a kind of a complex model with perfect foresight. It's a, it's a more, much more complex model than CG. Um, but I also want to address uh, kind of some of the big issues brought out by Dr. Omer and, and Dr. Marie Newell, which are very relevant about when we think about the country and economic policies in, in that country, how do we incorporate the political or, or institutional constraints in that country? I think 
I faced this problem when I was preparing the, the regional impact study, the, the fallout of war. Um, and that is a major concern. So there is a political economy constraint within the country. But I think one of the things that we shouldn't forget while discussing this is that there is also a political economy constraint outside the country. So my background is international trade. And in, in that literature, it's very well known that international engagements, including the IFI's engagements uh, with uh, single uh, countries, they are, these are self-enforcing, which means that there is no higher authority who can choose what will happen. These are all, all based on some sort of a bargaining process. So there is a very complex political economy constraint that regulates the country's engagement with the international community, including single donors or group of donors in the case of IFI. So when we need when we analyze the political constraints, it's both within the country and outside the country. And in the fallout of war report, we try to kind of see what can be done given the current conditions and we develop a, a two-level analysis and one is that what can be done within such political economy constraints so we have this political economy constraints and is there a room for improvement within these constraints if these constraints do not change going forward and in this case if you talk about elite capture in a specific country. Well, I'm afraid if the elites are not going anywhere and if they still have the, 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 the position and if that political econ economic complexity will not change, then we have to think about what can we do within that context, within that, without a major structural change, what can be done? And that leads to a certain set of policy recommendations in the case of the fallout of war report. The other one, the other big question, I think that's some, sometimes more important, is that how can such political economy constraints be changed in these countries? So exactly. not only what we can do within those constraints, but also can we change those constraints in these countries? And that is that is another very big problem. And I think Dr. Omar, is in one of his slides, he mentioned that individual countries sometimes are unable to change these constraints by themselves. And in the fallout of our report, we started thinking about what would a regional approach uh, in the Mashrek uh, look like. And the reason for that is that one, it's very difficult to stabilize one country in, in a region of instability. There's a lot of uh, cross-border uh, movements in terms of the public goods and also public bads that move across the borders. And, and uh, second, there's a lot of, when you look at the region's history, these cross-border linkages are quite important in actually establishing a more prosperous economic outcome for the region itself. But the question is, how do we go there? Is this a gradual transition, like a better linkage across countries, a more regional approach in solving problems, which is not the case by now, and that's a fair criticism. For example, when we think about refugee support for refugees, the internet, the donors provide country by country, year by year, sometimes project by project commitments to support. But it's also the other side, the national governments in this region, they also do not commit to a structural solution to re refugee problem. They also want to keep it short term and those two things reinforce each other. So going back to the original question, I think this is, this is a very relevant, but at the same time, very complex uh, problem. And hopefully we can have more opportunities to discuss uh, and I can talk more about the full other for report analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Harun. Uh, just uh, the problem that I think it's uh, challenging us is that uh, when you uh, uh, put the label of resilience and start to adapt with the static, static code that you have, or you start to ad adapt with the conflict as you don't have an, an escape. I think uh, the, the most important issue that when you are put a policy for the future, at least you address the transition. You are forced, you invest to transition, not you just uh, surround your weapons 
and your bargaining power as a society at least, and you say that I can't do anything about this situation. But thank you. This is, I think, in, at the heart of our discussion. And um, there is a, a, a question from La Laura. Uh, how, do, uh, how do you build a sustainable security system with the current state of MENA economies? All of face significant problems, I mean, taking aside the GCC. Is there a need for a targeted, uh, well-executed financial program? Who is going to finance it? I think um, uh, Marine Whale and Omar, uh, you can, if you want to address this or any other uh, uh, questions or comments. And of course, uh, Holly, if you want to uh, to, uh, to end, because we are now, we've, we, we, uh, we reached the end of the session. So I will give uh, each one of you one minute to comment. Uh, or two minutes, if they allow us in the uh, in, as uh, the World Bank hosting the uh, the discussion. So please, uh, I'll start with Mary Noel, then Omar, then Hol. Um, thank you, Rabia. I'll try to synthesize. I'm not very good at it, and try to reply to the question while reacting a bit to Holly's, uh, if I may, intervention. Thank you very much on on the details uh, on Jordan, notably. I. Allow me to start a bit candidly. Um, uh, just, just wait, wait, can, uh, can I interrupt you, please? Uh, because yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a raising hand that I didn't see it. So sorry for that. So Louise, uh, can you please uh, uh, raise your question? And before we start to answer, sorry, Mary. Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be very brief. I'm Louise Vieta with the Bretton Woods Project, working uh, based in London. I would uh, appreciate uh, Ms. Bernard's uh, response to whether she recognizes some of the critiques um, being made of uh, IFI programming in the region and more globally, particularly, for example, on the extent to which she feels that previous support by the IMF and the, and the bank have indeed eroded state capacity and contributed to the entrenchment of uh, the capture. And if she does, and if you do recognize that, can you speak a bit onto how the bank in particular is trying to address the previous shortcomings of its programs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, please, uh, Mary Noel, sorry for the interruption, please. Okay, uh, no, no problem. So a very, very candid, naive question with, with the, 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 the huge, uh, I mean, uh, the, the important technical resources and expertise and resources to core the, the, the World Bank has. Um, and the very well documented and really like known evidence based data we have globally, I mean, our colleagues at Development Pathways to cite only this kind of research have very much well documented how targeting and um, targeting formulas, notably PMTs, include such a, a huge, uh, huge exclusion and er inclusion errors, and do not really, I mean, um, succeed in covering uh, people in need. So, with these resources uh, that, that the World Bank has, why not invest in, for example, if there is such a will to support structural reform in MENA countries? in Jordan or in Lebanon, for example, in Tunisia, why not support, because this is notably also a, 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 something that is, I'm digressing with myself, why not support national social registries? Uh, an argument that is often used to justify further fragmentations of these schemes we have in, in our national context. So where we, in Jordan, we have the NAF and then so many targeting schemes. For example, in Lebanon, the NSSF, it is the social insurance, and a wide array of other schemes and targeting schemes. Why? And a main argument that is used for, against the unification of a national, universal, and inclusive social protection system in these countries is that there is no data. So maybe my question may be irrelevant, but not, why not, or naive? But why not invest in unified social national registries in these countries? And also um, to, to try, try and reply to, to the question about how to finance, basically. Obviously, we need national social, not national social security systems. So I will not play on words and use protect, a euphemized social protection word. Um, 
the, the, the easiest, but also as Dr. Under said, easy is also very complex, but the easiest way is to create an enabling uh, and a fiscal space where that would be, and these systems would be um, financed primarily by progressive taxation. This is a form of uh, resources, but also all this aid, uh, many countries, all the countries in the region are aid rent, live from aid rent. Aid can be and should be channeled towards national social security systems. This is another way of financing this, these systems. How these systems should be, ideally, they would be based on a life cycle. So since the person is born until they are dead, and they would be multi-tiered with the, 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 the bulk of security and protection would be based on social insurance and then social assistance or targeting would only be a component of this universal rights-based system. Ideally for us, these would be the easy but yet complex uh, solutions. Thank you, Rabia. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Noel. And uh, Omar, uh, I think there is two things about the institution and about the uh, so social protection programs, if you want to. I'll just, any thank you so much. I'll just make two quick concluding thoughts that are not necessarily directly about those, but, but are broader issues. And the, I appreciate my colleagues' comments and responses. They're very thoughtful, and I wish we had more time to engage in this discussion, uh, very illuminating. Two quick points, there are, lot, there are billions, there is no lack of spending in the region. It's what are the priorities on the spending? Is it going into warfare? Is it going into unsustainable types of expenditures? So I think one main issue is what are the priorities of the different countries regionally and globally when they're spending in the region? And how can we redirect these priorities from investments in conflict and war and securitization to investments in human development. And I wanted to return to my second point to the broader point. Uh, I know we're really beyond time, but just to make to make a broader point about the lack of strategic vision, the lack of uh, thinking about an alternative development model that could attract a societal consensus that would have accompanied the, the democratic transitions. And I just give an example that I, you know, other people have, have raised this issue. Um, in the aftermath of World War II, the Marshall Plan uh, was $15 billion, which was 5% of US GDP at that time. So just to go back to the Bretton Woods project. 5% uh, of GDP in 2010, US GDP was $700 billion. Okay. Uh, after the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya, the, the G20 uh, or the G8, all uh, you know, the richest countries, US, Canada, Europe, Germany, all of them met and pledged $40 billion for Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya for the transition. And those $40 billion, $20 of billion was gonna, supposed to come from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, not even from those rich countries. And uh, the, the IMF and the World Bank was expected to provide some of the other 20 billion. So there was the, the, um, uh, the most important Arab country in the region was not supported in its first democratic transition, its history, by something that is 1% of what the Marshall Plan was. No one have expected, of course, that type of spending. But I think that shows the lack of strategic engagement. And I think, again, I, I understand the point that the multi-IFIs are not independent. They have also constraints, but I think they have significant ability to influence our thinking uh, uh, of our entire approach to development. And I think that's that's what is needed. Thank you very much, uh, Omar. And uh, uh, I just want also to highlight uh, an, uh, an important issue that most of the time we look for the issue of uh, social security and subsidies from uh, targeting the poor people and not from the problem in the structural uh, uh, challenges in the economy. So for example, the low price of fuel it is in the in these economies because there is a structural problem. So if you increase the prices of oil, it will not be by default that you will increase the efficiency and you will increase the competitiveness because of the structural problems. 
So it's not just about targeting poor, it's also about the structure of the economy that need to be changed when we think about the subsidies. And I will leave the final words to, uh, to Holly, please. Thank you. Thanks so much again for the very uh, rich discussion. I won't be able to do justice to everything and I know we're, we're over time. Um, so I think on, on Louise's question, I think we need another month long maybe seminar to have a full answer to that. And I won't pretend to be able to, to respond to that. But I think just to say that I think, um, you know, I, I come back to the, you know, what are our World Bank dual mandate? Um, it's reducing poverty and promoting shared prosperity, right? So in everything we do, and this is something that we try to keep very central to our program here, is how do we think about that inclusion and shared prosperity agenda, right? And I think um, for the bank and for the MENA region in particular, in the post Arab Spring, we also have a regional strategy that has a lot of focus on some of the structural issues that you're raising around inclusion, women's economic opportunities, participatory governance. So I think as a, as a region, we've really tried to focus on some of those underlying structural challenges that we you know, we have identified as, um, you know, maybe areas that we certainly did not pay as much attention to pre-Arab Spring and that have to be very much central uh, to our approach in everything we do going forward. Um, so, but, uh, but I think we should reserve another month to, to talk through that in, in greater detail. And then just to say uh, quickly on Maria Noel's point, I actually very much agree with the idea, let's invest in targeting schemes. And in fact, that's, the social protection work here, uh, the big chunk of it has been to develop a national unified registry. So um, just to say that I, I agree with you, I think um, uh, the reforms have to come first before we make these major investments, we should make sure we're, we're investing in a structure um, that's, you know, doing the right thing and targeting right um, vulnerable populations. Um, and then just to close and say thank you, I, I think uh, for the very thought provoking presentations as well as questions, I think, you know, as the bank we're trying to do as much as we can within our mandate to tackle some of these and we can certainly always improve and do better and the dialogue with all of you, uh, I think really very much helps us in that endeavor. So again, many thanks and over back to you, Dr. Ravi. Thank you very much for all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad and I hope that was useful for you, for the participants, for the panelists, and also for the people who are watching us on the on the stream. Uh, thanks and I hope this discussion we can uh, have another spaces to continue and to invest in. Thanks a lot and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for uh... Rabia and uh, all uh, the